Uh, what do you make of that? What do you, well, what do you, I, I think it's great. Uh, for me, I always <laughs> observe technology from the cheap seats. I'm just a trend spotter, and I, I, I kind of notice things. And uh, I, uh, sort of, I, I noticed a long time ago that data was going to be increasingly the focus of competitive advantage. It was really, uh, you know, it was really through a process of analogy, uh, looking at what happened with the IBM PC. You know, there was this idea that, um, you know, hardware was the source of lock-in in the IBM era, and when they introduced the PC, they thought hardware was still the source of lock-in, but yet they introduced this commodity PC, which completely destabilized the industry. They signed away the future to Microsoft because they didn't realize that software was going to become valuable as hardware became a commodity. So I started asking myself, what happens when software becomes a commodity? And I saw that happening through open source software and the open protocols of the internet. So I started asking myself, what's the next source of uh, competitive advantage? And I came to the conclusion that it was large databases generated through collective action over the internet. And of course you see that. And that, that was really the heart of my thinking about Web 2.0. But what's so exciting about uh, this conference is you now have real practitioners coming forward and saying, this stuff and talking about how they're doing it. You it's, know, it's real become, world, it's, mainstream. It's, yeah, real world, mainstream. And we were here yesterday and it was really, you could, it was palpable. Yeah. You know? And we're starting <clears> to take it uh, you know, away from uh, just the consumer internet in areas like finance and starting to look at the potential impact in areas, for example, like healthcare, uh, where there's a massive problem that could be handled very differently if we built the kind of feedback loops that we see uh, in uh, today's application. So with all the so, so with all the, the trend hype and the mega trends of converged mm -hmm. networking, you talk about some of the trends over the years, but converged networking, cloud and mobility, I mean, those are all inside, you know, industry kind of topics and we all mm -hmm. kind of talk about it and, and know that. But is this data revolution, this data phenomenon with Strata and what you what you guys are doing here, is this just a touch point for real people to kind of get it? Like oh, see examples? I, I, absolutely. Um, you know I think what's really made all of this concrete is the smartphone. You know, when I, years ago I started talking about this idea that we were building an internet operating system and that it was, the, the subsystems of it would be databases. And it was very abstract. But now, you know, when you pick up your smartphone and you ask for directions or you ask for the nearest Chinese restaurant or, you know, it becomes pretty obvious. Oh yeah. That information is not on my phone. Um, you know, effectively, it's reaching out to some big database over the yeah. internet, and so people don't necessarily think about it. But when you explain it, they go, "Oh yeah, yeah, yeah." You know, you know, in the old days, think about you know your your uh, you know GPS device. You had a CD-ROM. You know, maybe they had the maps, and you had to get a new one. <laughs> now it's sort of like, hey, this thing is downloading mm. my phone in real time, based on where I am in real time. And, uh, you know, oh, and by the way, it's got real-time traffic conditions. And, uh, you know, all those things start to just be part of people's expectations. And the change, I think, is, I mean, there's a couple things. I mean, consumers are becoming used to it. So the question then User becomes, experience. why is this not working the way I expect? But there are big industries that are lagging, you know, where there are massive amounts of data, but it's not being used uh, correctly often because of structural issues. Structural legacy. issues, yeah. I mean, uh, healthcare yeah. being a great yeah. example. Yeah. You know, we have data uh, that could tell us, uh, you know, what procedures work and which ones don't, and yet we still pay for the volume of procedures. <laughs> you know, we don't, you know, our whole yeah, yeah, yeah. reimbursement system does not differentiate between doing more of the things that work or just doing more of anything. Yeah. You know, and, and um, so, uh, you know, there, there are changes in the works, for example, in, the, in you know, the Accountable Care Act, where I think we may start to see some changes coming down eventually in Medicare reimbursement that will start to, to trigger marketplace changes. And I, I think what's really exciting to me is that we, you know, we have there in healthcare a really big problem, you know, something that's going to literally bankrupt the country if it's not solved. Uh, we have outmoded business models uh, and yet we have, uh, in this data revolution, the potential uh, to really make a difference. So we hear a lot about privacy, it's been talked about a lot, but I'd like to hear your take on it. So, like for instance, who owns the data? I mean, do we have to see a change in whether it's public policy? What's your angle on that? Um, 
I think it's very, very hard to frame this uh, um, in the way that most civil libertarians would like. Uh, and the reason is that so many of these databases become valuable only when they have all the data. You know, so this idea that we can go back to a, uh, a world in which you know, the individual user kind of keeps his data or her, her data private, I, I, I think is, uh, it, it would be wonderful, but I, I don't know how we do it because the utility comes from giving up privacy. You know, when you, uh, you know, want to use your mobile phone, you are telling the carrier and your location and Google, you're telling your location yeah yeah sure you can say oh yeah don't uh you know release my location but then all of a sudden you have all these applications that don't work <laughs> you know and so people will go oh well of course i'll release my location so then it really becomes a matter of indifference you know, really to how indifferent they are to what that, I, right? yeah well to, to benefit so, indifference to benefit right no, well, so I think people will give up a lot of formally private information to all kinds of people. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, it's very, very easy to, you know, you can say, oh, well, we can anonymize certain things and so on. But you really, it's very, very easy to re-identify people. Uh, when you have enough uh, data sources, you start to be able to, uh, you know, pull patterns out and recognize people regardless of, uh, how much anonymization. So that makes sense. So, so, so what, what, what I think that we need to shift is to defining certain classes of harm and then penalizing those harms. Whereas what we have right now is we're trying to prevent the possibility of harm. You know, so if you look at, for example, going back to healthcare, you look at HIPAA, the health, health uh, records of privacy. Hypotheticals, yeah. Yeah, it's sort of like we must keep some kind of data privacy moat around all this information course that means that we can't do a lot of useful things with it meanwhile what are we really trying to prevent we're trying to prevent adverse selection by insurance companies all yes, right right you know right so you know wouldn't it be better to say okay well, you know, of course which is what you know the uh, you know the the uh, health bill was trying to do is say hey insurance companies can't uh, deny coverage based on pre-existing conditions all of a sudden then it becomes much less critical uh, to you know, hide uh, medical data, and of course, even then, it's sort of the privacy issues. Are, are, I've always thought of a little bit overblown. You know, oh my God, we can't let anybody know that Aunt Jane has cancer. Meanwhile, she's talking to her church group about it. You know, yeah, and this, yeah. you know, <laughs> well, <laughs> so, so, and this gossip all around her neighborhood. You know, so uh, so where I was going with that is, yeah. and I agree with that. By the yeah. way, my, my my thinking is more. I want access to my data, yeah. and I don't. I feel as though I don't have a right to it. I don't have yes. access. So should I? Should should there be some kind of public policy? Says, Right, okay, we're going to get over that whole civil yeah, yeah. libertarian thing, but you must give some kind of access, and it's yeah. incumbent upon you as the yeah. data provider to, to access to me as the consumer. Well, Is I, that reasonable? I, or? No, I, I think it's, it's reasonable, but um, a little bit wrong-headed. And the reason why it's wrong-headed is if you require it of people, They'll do a bad job of it. They'll, you know, this is like the disclosures on credit card forms, you know, and they'll send you some big complicated form that you, you know you're never going to read, and you don't really, you know, or you can update your credit report, but it's such a nightmare that you're never going to do it. So if it's right. productized, so and what, I pay so, for it. Maybe yeah. That, so that's, that's so what we have okay. to do is to find uh, actual applications and tools that are really useful for people uh, where they when they manage their own data, yep. and if we can do that, uh, then uh, we will start to change the perception. So there's a startup that was shown at the start showcase here, uh, Singly, uh, you know, where Jeremy Miller, who was the guy who built Jab originally, is trying to build uh, sort of a tool set where you will download all your data from all the social sites and so on into a local store. But it's not from this, you know, idea that, um, oh, now it's mine and I can you know, take it away from these other guys because it's only useful when it's out there on the other sites. Mm -hmm. It's more like I want to build a platform in which people can innovate, build innovative interfaces and innovative tools so they can do more useful stuff with your data. And if we actually can start that kind of virtuous cycle going, then the market will start to address some of these issues. The incentive so, system. Yeah. So, 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 so Tim, uh, let's talk about something that's kind of a little bit different that no one's really talking about. It's, it's been some hallway chatter between some you know, bigger companies mm -hmm. and startups. Obviously, um, 
the startup community is robust right now with data, and you know we're seeing the charity mm -hmm. with Y Combinator and all these mm -hmm. things, um, giving out a lot of money yep. and, and, and stuff. But big companies are also retraining, and a lot of the new technology, even for the big companies, hasn't been around five years ago. So there's a real emphasis on a workforce, whether yep. it's entrepreneurial workforce yep. and or um, IT as a service or cloud, yeah, sure. and how that's yep. all mobile. What is uh, your angle on that? And obviously, trainings are super important. Um, but what are you seeing in terms of the trends for that? I mean, obviously, uh, you sell books to help people yeah, get yeah. knowledgeable. Yeah. I mean, this is a major issue right now, yeah. unprecedented at the scale. I mean, yeah. a massive tsunami of data, the world's shifting pretty fast. Um, classic training kind of doesn't work. So mm -hmm. is it a crowdsource model? Is it a Groupon for training? Is it uh, the live streaming things that we're doing? What's your, uh, what's your you angle know, on all I this? think uh, to get good at um, you know, the kind of skills, you know, it's a professional skill and yeah, people need real training. Uh, that being said, it's it's been happening. I remember, I think it was Mike Franklin is a UC Berkeley professor told me, uh, must have been three years ago, he said, you know, uh, uh, they're teaching Hadoop to all, uh, you know, cons computer science freshmen now, you know, versus, uh, you know. Pascal I mean, years ago when I went yeah, to school, yeah, you know, and, so, <laughs> and some yeah, other so, stuff in between then, John. Um, and that was one of the things that put it on my radar. It's like, oh, you know, this is really coming up, really, up, yeah. up and coming. And I, I think we will, you know, the data set um, and the skill sets are uh, becoming pretty obvious to people. And I think, you know, there'll be people, obviously people who are really good at it are going to be very high demand. Uh, they're already in high demand in, in uh, you know, financial services, and they have been for years. I mean, is it, is, is, it a, is it a data also. jock, quant jock kind of guy? You see in computer science, obviously, intersecting with data sets as a developer yeah. environment. Uh, we've wrote about that yeah. at SiliconANGLE. And so yeah. you got computer science guys actually coding you know, data, kind of, mm -hmm. you know, the old model was, you know, yeah. quant jocks out, you know, in the basement yeah. working with huge data warehouses. Yeah. That's changing. What are well, the skills? I think, I, think, well, I think it's great. I mean, there are going to be a lot of... Um, of people coming from uh, hard sciences, you know, physicists and the like, as they've been going into financial services, now there's more opportunity for them. Uh, I think it's good. You know, I, I, I think, you know, you can have a shortage for a while, but eventually, you know, the market corrects. So I'm not too worried about it. Meanwhile, there are plenty of opportunities for companies like mine to try to accelerate the learning curve. What do you think the cycle is on this data? It's like we were, Dave and I were speculating earlier when we kicked off the show, you know, on the storage side, it's pretty slow. It's, you know, five to 10 year horizon before, you know, platforms can be built. And there's a comment on stage by one of the presenters saying, oh, the Microsoft guy, oh, it's 90 days and then we're cloud, that's like an eternity. But I mean, it's just, this is going to be a cycle that's going to have a duration. What is your view on that? Is it going to be like the classic internet dog years, kind of seven years, or it's going to be more longer built out? Or is how mean, long will this, before, this before data cycle? I think it's it's uh, five years, ten years. We're going to ramp up slowly. It's going to be a massive shift up, or is it uh, well, more complex? Uh, you know, I, I guess I would say uh, first off, um, it, it, you know, it's a continuation of you know the the, compu the evolution of the computer industry. You know, just think back, you know, twenty five years ago. Uh, maybe a little longer ago, like you know, thir thir certainly 30, well, 30 years ago, think about, you know, you could say a computer on every desk and in every home was an aggressive goal for Microsoft. And now we take for granted the computers everywhere. Uh, software uh, is, is ubiquitous. Data-driven applications are going to become ubiquitous. But the transformation in industries, uh, you know, Still has a long way to go, and some are further along than others. Um, so you see this as, as powerful as the PC client server? It's not a flash in the pan. Oh, I mean, oh God, no. clearly. No. I, I, mean, I mean, way more than client server. I mean, it's 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 certainly as it's bigger than the, than. I mean, it, it, it's hard to say. It's, it's a continuation. Than, it's, it's a continuation. A continuation. If it's you look at the continuum from the PC through the, the internet, this is the next stage. So, um, and things like, uh, you know, client server were actually evolutionary dead ends. You know, if you, if you look, it was really the, you know, the real issue was getting ubiquitous computing, you know, where computers were everywhere. So, you know, yeah. the computer and then the, 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 I guess the smartphone is another big, big You now have the, the edge. You have and, the edge. And then you the have the, the, the network, mm -hmm. you know, becoming the ubiquitous platform. And now it's like, okay, what happens on the network? And what happens on the network are these, data-driven applications. 
and I think we're going to see them penetrating into more and more aspects of our lives. You know, we, we already see, you know, demos of self-driving cars. We're going to see a lot more yeah. robotics. <laughs> these things, you know, these are fundamentally driven by data applications. You know, I mean, yeah. um, uh, you know, we're going to see it going into new industries. There's already big industries yeah. that have been data-driven for years, uh, but increasingly, uh, you know, there's going to be more advantage in data. A good, a good example of this, Alex Rampell, who's a really smart guy on this subject, uh, runs a company called Trial Pay, said to me recently, uh, we were talking about, uh, we'd just gone to lunch. The place was packed when we went in, and it was empty when we came out. And he said, you know what's wrong with Groupon? Is that they don't have enough of a sense of time. You know, people, that restaurant didn't want any more people at 1230. They wanted more people at 130. Yeah. And so Groupon, t to continue to succeed, will yeah, have to become we'll, we'll a real-time. We'll hear from the Groupon CTOs coming on right. from the queue. They'll have to become more of a real-time uh, inventory management system for perishable time slots. You know, and, and you think about that, and you go, oh, yeah. And so that's so more real-time, more data. Um, you know, already you have this wonderful aspect of, of say, group purchasing. Uh, but think about how much yeah. better that will be when that system is smarter. We're here with Tim O'Reilly inside the Cube at his conference for O'Reilly Media going on Strata, uh, making data work, making things happen. Um, just a final question from my standpoint, and then Dave, you give one final question for I know he's got to go, Maureen's kind of hovering. Um, you've been involved in collective intelligence and data for a long time. What's different now? I mean, what's, you know, that, because a lot of work's been done in this area, but what's the flashpoint right now? What makes today, this time, and going forward unique? From just quickly explain to the group. group well, I, I, I think it's uh, it, it's really just been a, it's a tipping point where everybody is aware of that this is uh, the frontier where value is being created. Uh, you know, when I first started talking about this, say with our Web two events in in uh, two thousand five. Uh, one VC came up to me and said, "Will you stop talking about this?" <laughs> you know, because he, he, you know, he was like, "This is we're investing, you know, on this trend." And you know, don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> he was he was joking, yeah, but yeah. you know, uh, and now everybody knows it, and and so that th that's one part of the tipping point. Now the other tipping point that's still I think in our future is, um, or, or you know, something that's already unfolding, is. Uh, there's a dark side to all this because, of course, you know you see all the stories now about Google fighting the spammers or cybersecurity, um, you know, uh, uh, fraud and payments. There's an underbelly. Uh, there's an underbelly. An unregulated and, 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 underbelly. And we're going to be seeing, I think, a lot of struggles over the next few years in dealing uh, with, you know, fraud and abuse, and uh, gaming, the gaming of systems, and so on. And you know, I would predict that actually some of the most valuable people in the next wave are going to be people who uh, have experience specifically in the big data of risk, big data risk analysis. Yeah, so my last comment, that's really not a question, it's just an observation, it's the second time you've been on theCUBE, and, yeah. and you've, you're a great storyteller, you're known as a great storyteller, but your ability to take sort of this information from alpha geeks and turn it into, into a, a business narrative is, is something that our audience loves. I've been monitoring it, we, get, we had 5,300 people on watching you, mm -hmm. so thank you very much for mm -hmm. coming on, and, Glad to and we really appreciate the support. All right, thank you. Uh, Tim O'Reilly well, inside nice the Cube. Thank you. Great right, to see you again. You. All right, take care. All right, uh, pleasure. Thank congratulations you. Congratulations on a great show. Uh, All right.